Good morning, good day, good evening, whenever you're watching or listening to this. Welcome once again to Just Thoughts. Today we're going to be talking about the Apostle Stephen. In other words, Stephen being one of those who was martyred for the name of Christ. We're going to entitle this Bible study, uh, Stephen's Test and Death. As we know, he, he was killed. And... Uh, this study will and should be a great example to you of how to you conduct yourself when you are delivered up. In other words, the faith and the confidence. And you will see how Stephen argues here and uh, what manner he uses. And it's not going to be anything vicious. It's going to be purely love for our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and for spreading his word. And he will be talking against a bunch of people that hate him, much like it will be in the end times when you are delivered up before those who accurse you and hate you for speaking the truth. So, again, we're going to call this Stephen's Test, that is to say Stephen's Delivering Up, and Stephen's Death, which is to say his martyrdom. So, we're going to be beginning this in the book of Acts, chapter 6. Acts, chapter 6. Uh, good, good time of year to be doing this with uh, Pentecost coming right up here. So, we're going to begin this as you should always do before you study our Father's Word. Let us go before our Father's throne and let us ask for wisdom, guidance, and understanding from the source, from our Heavenly Father. So, let us pray and let us pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, glory be unto thy most holy name, O Heavenly Father. We come before you this day, Father, to ask for wisdom and guidance and understanding of these, your most holy scriptures, from your most holy word. We ask, Father, that you touch eyes and ears and hearts and minds to be able to receive deeper truths. We ask that your hands always be upon these studies, Father, to enlighten us, to show us the path of light to walk upon. And we ask, Father, that you open minds and hearts to be able to see these deeper meanings. And we ask these things, Father, in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. Now, you might see there that I went kind of double with minds and hearts. Um, you know, I begin to worry about some of you brothers and sisters, some of you fellow chapel students, some of you fellow Christians, some of you fellow teachers, some of you who have been studying with me. I've been receiving a lot of comments lately that uh, are, well, the only thing I can say is that they are confusing to say the least from some of you which I have known, spoken to, uh, at least commented to, and talked with back and forth, answered your questions. Some people are coming up with some radical stuff, and I don't know where they're coming up with it from. And I'm beginning to wonder if some of you aren't beginning to fall away. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that I'm the only truth going out there, or anything like that, and I am by no means saying that I cannot be mistaken, but... Some of the things I've been hit with lately from uh, well-learned students of our Father's words have, have been shocking, to say the least. And I'm not talking about that they were derogatory towards me or putting me down or anything like that. They're just comments that do not befit someone who has studied of our Father's word. It's almost like someone has showed you a new doctrine and you've bitten on it hook, line, and sinker and you've completely fallen away from the path. You know, maybe the great falling away is beginning. Maybe some have not been as well founded as we've thought in previous times, but uh, 
I would advise you to get back into your Father's Word and start studying and praying very vehemently so that you don't get lost here at the 11th hour because as uh, Brother Dennis says, it's getting late at the day. So anyway, we're going to jump right into this now having asked a prayer and a word of wisdom from our Father with Acts chapter 6 and um, verse 1. And you will see where the subject goes with this as we move along with it. So, Acts chapter 6 and verse 1, and it reads, And in those days, when the number of disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Uh, obviously, the Hebrews not quite taking care of business, uh, when you say Hebrew here, it can mean a number of things. It can mean a Jew, and that a, we, we know that there are false Jews, uh, and we know that they uh, have used some underhanded things uh, down through history. Or we can be talking about, you know, true Hebrews. That is to say, Hebrews of the, uh, of the tribes, the tribes of Israel. But uh, at any rate, verse 2. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them, and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. In other words, th this that the Greeks are murmuring about is no reason for us to leave the word of God and, and start uh, serving tables. Uh, you could look at it that way. I mean, that's kind of the most sensible way to look at it. It's... It's even kind of like waiting tables. In other words, we've got more important things that we need to be doing with our time. Verse 3. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men. In other words, search out seven men, seven being the number of spiritual completeness, of honest report, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom ye may appoint over this business. In other words, to take care of this ministration is to... Uh, appease the Gentiles, to appease the Greeks. The Greeks at this time, just coming to the word of our Father's God, the Grecians, and uh, some of them coming to the word a little bit faster than the uh, Jews, so to speak. And, uh, yeah, they're murmuring, they're unhappy with the ministration that's going on. So, they're looking for seven honest men to overtake this. This has the connotation of seven Seven being spiritual completeness, like I said, and uh, feeding those in need. In other words, kind of like the elect do. The, the 7,000 very elect being teachers of these end times. Uh, feeding the people as, as they are needed. In other words, as they are want to do, according to the words of Christ. In Mark 13 and Matthew 24, talking about the good steward who is supposed to be feeding the household. Verse 4. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. In other words, you search out seven men and find somebody to take care of these. But we're going to give ourselves continually in prayer and to the ministry, that is to say the ministration of the word, taking the words and spreading them forth. In other words, taking care of the duties that God has set before us to spread the word forth. Verse 5. And saying pleased the whole, uh, excuse me, verse 5, verse 5, and the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Procurus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, verse 6, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. In other words, to kind of uh, to kind of bless them, and as to kind of follow the rules of James chapter five. Uh, and not only that, the Levitical priesthood would have hands laid on them when they were anointed. This is kind of an anointing of sorts, a a passing of the mantle to these men to do the the works of God. Verse seven. And the word of God increased. And the number of disciples multitude in Jerusalem greatly. Now that, that's a feat in itself that it moved, multiplied in Jerusalem. And a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. That is to say, the 
uh, the faith of Jesus Christ. Verse 8. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Verse 9. Then arose certain of the synagogue, bet you can't guess which synagogue we're talking about here, which called, uh, which is called the synagogue of the libertines. <laughs> Uh, you might want to look some of these words up. And the Cyrenians, and the Alexandrians, and of them of Sicilia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. In other words, in the synagogues, you're always going to have somebody, uh, when they're attached to the old faith, who are going to argue about Christianity and it being fake. And that's one of the reasons these seven men were chosen to go and basically, you know, I, I forgot to give you the example. This this uh, waiting tables is kind of like um, dealing with students that have to be fed specially. In other words, uh, in school, when I went to school, we had a group called the compensatory group. And there were people with special needs. In other words, they were people that were a little bit slow on the uptake and, and needed a, li a little more handling, a little more feeding. And that's what this really alludes to when it comes to uh, the waiting tables thing. In other words, we, and not only that, the women were supposed to ask their husband, the men, about certain things in the Bible in these times. Uh, like I said, I realize in these times there are many good women pastors who are, who are teaching the truth. I know some myself, but um, regardless of that, they are following through on the Word of God, and they're trying to deliver and see that no one is neglected. Okay, and that's that's what the Grecians were arguing about in the first place. But now you've got the synagogue, the synagogue, the Jews, uh, who have spread out into these lands, who are trying to take uh, the old law, the Torah, and no doubt their Babylonian Talmud, to the world. And, of course, they don't like the message of Jesus Christ. Go figure. Verse 10, and they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. In other words, much as it had been with Christ, much as it was with Paul and Peter, they could not resist the Holy Spirit. Because why? The Holy Spirit is our Father speaking through you, giving you the words to speak. So, these, uh, these scribes and Pharisees, as it were, these uh, stubborn men, these holy synagogue uh, priests are unable to withstand the wisdom that comes from the Holy Spirit. Be because why? Because they are full of the doctrines of men which make void the Word of God. They're like a lot of the liberals today. A lot of the liberals don't even know what they're arguing for. They don't know what they stand for. When you ask them questions, such as about the Second Amendment or what an assault rifle is, they're like a deer in the headlights. You know, they're like, What's an assault rifle? Uh, that is a rifle that assaults people. Okay. So you get, you get the idea. Verse 11. And when they had suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. Uh, you could say when they had hired men. In other words, these are false witnesses, okay? Who said that we heard him speak against Moses and against God, and of course, this was something you didn't do in the synagogue. Even though Moses spake of Christ, and, you know, God himself spake of Christ all through the Old Testament, these guys are more worried about, you know, what they think. And uh, that's been the story the whole, along, uh, the whole time along, the whole controversy. Even back in Christ's time when he was healing, you know, he healed on the Sabbath day. He broke the law of Moses. You know, uh, he broke the law that the Lord has set forth. Well, how can God in the flesh break the law of the Lord doing the will of the Lord? You know, th this is the kind of logic that uh, rained down from these, and it's quite frankly the kind of numbskulled logic that we see uh, from the uh, left wing these days. Verse 12. And they stirred up the people. Oh, this is what they do. You know, this is what they do. If you remember the last lecture, they stirred up people against Christ so that he would be crucified. 
or maybe it was the lecture before, but regardless, they stirred up the people. In other words, caused a ruckus, got them all mad. And the elders and the scribes came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council. In other words, brought him to a Sanhedrin, arrested him and took him before the council. This is a delivering up, friend. Verse 13. And set up false witnesses. That's real holy, isn't it, for priests to set up liars against a man? Which said, This man seeth us not to speak blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. In other words, this is what they said about Stephen, but Stephen hadn't said nothing against the law. Stephen was preaching the law via Christ. Verse 14. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered to us, or delivered us. Now, um, they're somewhat right about this because there were things that were nailed to the cross with Christ and were changed. That the law of Moses was not able to save people by, but that the New Testament of Christ, Christ's blood shed upon the cross, could save people by. However, they are lying here. He did not say this. In other words, they're stretching the truth at the very least. Verse 15. And all they that sat on the council looking steadfastly on him saw his face as if it had been the face of an angel. In other words, why? He was filled with the Spirit, brothers and sisters. Acts chapter 7 and verse 1. Then said the high priest, Are these things so? Don't make me get up and rent my clothes. Verse 2. And he said, Men, brethren, and fathers, hearken. In other words, all of you on this council, men, my brethren, supposedly, and fathers, which is to say, uh, you could say that these people were fathers, but really this, this has the kind of connotation that the Catholics use, I hate to say, even though you're not supposed to call any man father on earth. It means an elder man, okay? Even if you go and look it up, it's probably going to amount to fathers, but it's a tender way of saying it. Then he says, hearken, the glory of God appeared unto our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia. Before he dwelt in Quran, okay, it, it appeared to him in Ur. That's where that's where Abraham was from, in in, uh, in Babylon, quite frankly. And what did it tell him? Get out of Babylon, come out of confusion. That's the metaphoric message of that. Verse three. And said unto him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred, and come into the land which I shall show thee. In other words, the the promised land. Verse four. Then came he out of the land of the Chaldeans. That lets you know right there what land it was. Babylon. And dwelt at Quran. And from thence, when his father was dead, he removed him into this land wherein you now dwell. In other words, we're, ta we're talking about the Holy Land here. Verse 5. And he gave him none inheritance in it. No, not so much as to set his foot on. Yet he promised that he would, he would give him, to him for a possession and to his seed after him when he as yet had no child. In other words, God spoke to Abraham and said, I will multiply you, and in multiplying I shall multiply you as the stars of heaven, as the sands of the seashore. And he said, Thou shalt have a son, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, which means laughter. And he said, You shall have him in your old years, and through Isaac shall the seed be called. And all this was promised to him before he ever had a child. Verse 6. And God spake on this wise, that his seed should sojourn in a strange land. What, reckon, what land do you reckon the strange land was that his seed would sojourn in? Egypt. And that they should bring them into bondage and entreat them evil 400 years. Now, did that prophecy come to pass? Absolutely it did. I mean, we're, we're just passing Passover here not too long ago. So, uh, 
you know, I know what you know what the original Passover was. It was the children coming out of Egypt after 400 years. Verse 7. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage will I judge, said God. And after that they shall come forth and serve me in this place. In other words, I'm going to judge the nation that has held my children captive. And after that they shall come forth and serve me in this place. You should see a type in that. This earth age would be kind of uh, symbolic of that nation. Okay, that nation of bondage. Kind of symbolic of Egypt. In the last lecture, we showed that Egypt and uh, Sodom is what Jerusalem was spiritually called. Well, here, this kind of has to do with this earth age. and uh, Or you could say Babylon, okay? The Babylon of the end times. And the nation to whom they shall be in bondage, whether it was Egypt or Assyria or Babylon or Rome, or the end time Babylon, which is to come when the Antichrist shall be here, will I judge, in other words, God shall judge it, said God. And after that, they shall come forth and serve me in this place. Well, where are they at? They're in the Holy Land. What's going to happen when the true Christ returns and destroys the brightness of the Antichrist, as written in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2? The children are going to serve him in the millennium in that place. And for all time, quite frankly, verse 8. And he gave him the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begat Isaac and circumcised him the eighth day. Okay, eight being symbolic of new beginnings. A new beginning. And Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat the twelve patriarchs. In other words, the twelve fathers of the twelve tribes of Israel. Verse 9. And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him. In other words, Je uh, Joseph's own brothers, his 11 brothers, for envy of him because God was with him and God delivered unto him uh, dreams and because he was his father's favorite. Uh, and his father gave him the amazing uh, coat of many colors, uh, sold Joseph into the bondage of Egypt uh, through, a, through a caravan, if you remember the story. But God was with Joseph. Verse 10. And he delivered him out of all of his afflictions and gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all of his house, you see, God uses whomsoever he will, whensoever he will. His brothers thought that he was probably going to be killed or be a slave the rest of his life. But what ended up really happening? Well, he became, uh, Joseph became their ruler. Verse 11. Now there came a dearth, which is to say a drought, over all the land of Egypt and Canaan. That's, that's, that's what Canaan is, uh, if you didn't know, or Hanan, and great affliction, and our fathers found no sustenance. In other words, there, there was a big famine in the land, uh, like as in Amos chapter 8 shall come in the end times. Verse 12, but when Jacob heard there was corn in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. In other words, he, he sent the brothers to go into Egypt to buy corn. Verse 13, and at the second time, Joseph was made known to his brethren. Again, you would have to know this story that uh, the second time the brothers went down there because uh, Joseph withheld their youngest brother, his own brother, uh, by, their, by the same mother. Uh, they returned and Joseph made known to him who he was and he forgave his brothers. And Joseph kindred was made known unto Pharaoh. And, uh, in other words, Joseph introduced his family to Pharaoh, and Pharaoh said, hey, come on in, you know. And uh, they did, and they dwelled in Egypt, about 75 or so persons or something like that. Uh, verse 14, then sent Joseph and called his father Jacob to him. In other words, called him down to Egypt, and all his kindred. 
three score and 15 souls okay so that's three score 60 and 15 that's 75 so yeah I was I was on that verse 15 so Jacob went down to Egypt and died he and our fathers in other words all the patriarchs of the tribes of Israel died in Egypt verse 16 and were carried over into Sechem and laid in the sepulcher that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Emor the father of Sechem and uh, this is covered that Abraham bought this plot and uh, all who was buried there uh, uh, back in um, Genesis verse 17 but when the time of the promise drew nigh which God had sworn to Abraham the people grew and multiplied in Egypt in other words as God said God so did he kept his word and Abraham's children multiplied in Egypt the children of Israel multiplied in the land of Egypt verse 18 till another king arose remember what I said the word Pharaoh means it means king another Pharaoh arose which knew not Joseph in other words he didn't know Joseph didn't know all that Joseph had done for Egypt in saving them from the famine verse 19 and the same dealt subtly with our kindred and evil entreated our fathers so that they cast their young children to the end that they might not live in other words they they killed the firstborn of the children of Israel the males and uh, they did that to keep the population from growing does that kind of ring a bells in, with anyone about abortion or you know late term abortion probably won't resonate with any liberals but then again there are probably no liberals listening and I keep saying liberals when really what I mean is progressive communist um, a-holes so there you go verse 20 in which time Moses was born okay Moses uh, again means drawn from the water and uh, was exceeding fair and nourished up in his father's house three months in other words he, he stayed with his father and his mother for three months before uh, he, he was put out into the Nile verse 21 and when he was cast out Pharaoh's daughter took him up and nourished him for her own son again God taking control of the events to bring about events that happened in the Bible as he was with Joseph so he was with Moses and Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds now it says he's mighty in words and deeds here but what is it that Moses said to God he said who am I Lord that you should send me I am not a man of words and of course God gave him Aaron to speak for him but uh, of course you know there again Moses was on up in years he was uh, 80 years old whenever he went up to the burning bush and was sent into Egypt so that may have played a factor into it but you know I, I don't know what humans at that time were like Moses lived to be 120 years old and he was apparently sharp for the next 40 years so who knows about that we won't worry about that verse 23 and when he was full 40 years old it came into his heart to visit his brethren the children of Israel in other words he found out that he was an Israelite and it came into his heart to visit the children of Israel verse 24 and seeing one of them suffer wrong he defended him and avenged him that was oppressed and smote the Egyptian in other words there was an Egyptian uh, basically beating the pure crap out of an Israelite and would have killed him and Moses killed the Egyptian verse 25 for he supposed his brethren would have understood how that by God his hand would deliver them but they understood not you know this is what Christ uh, expected when he came he expected his children to receive him though he knew they they would not he sent John the Baptist in the way that was written in the Holy Word and he came in the way that was written in the Holy Word and his children denied him because they had listened to men and the men they had listened to were quite frankly the sons of Belial and when I say the sons of Belial I speak of the Kenites the sons of Cain 
the serpent seed line. Some people may view the serpent seed line as not a literal bloodline. They may view it as just the evil side of man. You know, if that's the way you view it, fine. But you're going to miss out on a lot of things in the Bible if you do uh, fall to that view. But, you know, perhaps you're able to overcome that and still see the truth. At any rate, uh, that's all I'll say about that for now. Verse 26. And the next day he showed himself unto them. As they strove, in other words, they were fighting with each other, and would have set them uh, at one again, saying, Sirs, ye are brethren, why do you wrong one to another? In other words, Moses is saying, y'all are Israelites, why are you doing wrong one to another? No, isn't it bad enough that the Egyptians are doing you wrong? Why are you doing wrong to one another? Verse 27, but listen to what they reply to him, and this is gratitude. But he that did his neighbor wrong thrust him away, saying, Who made thee a ruler over us and a judge over us? You know, this is so reminiscent of what the people of Sodom said to Lot. You know, who made thee a judge over us? And uh, also what the scribes and Pharisees would imply to Christ. Yet they went up and asked him for his judgment many times, hoping they could trip him up. Yet they never did. Verse 28. Will thou kill me as thou didst the Egyptian yesterday? In other words, th 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 that is a thankful Israelite right there. You know, th they hated the Egyptians. And Moses was an Egyptian with the power of an Egyptian. And he killed an Egyptian beating an Israelite. And this Israelite, who was there and no doubt witnessed it, said... Well, are you going to kill me the way you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Boy, gratitude. Verse 29. Then fled Moses at this saying, and was a stranger in the land of Madian. This is the land of Midian, where he begat two sons. Okay, Moses fled to the land of Midian. This is Saudi Arabia. And um, he would marry one of the daughters of the line of Midian, Zipporah, who was the daughter of Jethro. Hobab, who was called a Kenite, called a Kenite by land association, not because he was a Kenite, but because he dwelt in the land of the Kenites. Funny that the land of the Kenites would be part of Saudi Arabia and also part of Ethiopia in, in places in the Bible. Just saying. Verse 30. And when forty years were expired, then appeared to him in the wilderness of Mount Sinai the angel of the Lord in a flame of fire in a bush. Okay, so this would make Moses 80 years old. Verse 31. When Moses saw it, he wondered at the sight, and he drew near and behold, uh, to behold it, excuse me. And the voice of the Lord came unto him, verse 32, saying, I am the God of thy fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Then Moses trembled and durst not behold. In other words, he would not look upon the presence of God. Verse 33. Then the Lord said unto him, Put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place where thou standest is holy ground. In other words, why? God was there. Wherever God is, is holy ground. Again, when Christ comes and sets foot on this earth, it becomes his kingdom. It becomes holy ground. Verse 34, I have seen, I have seen, twice for emphasis, the affliction of my people which is in Egypt. And I have heard their groaning, and am come down to deliver them, and am now come, and I will send thee into Egypt. Verse 35, This Moses whom they refused, saying, Who made thee a ruler and a judge? The same did God send to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel which appeared to him in the bush. Now again, the same thing of Christ. Christ was sent, and the Kenites, of course, say, Who are you to sit in judgment of us? Of course, you know, I'm paraphrasing what they spoke to him. They accused him of all kinds of things. But he shall, and to those that have passed on, 
uh, of the Kenite line since that time, they know by God that he is their ruler. And he does sit at the right hand of God where they do not. Not judging them as to hell or not, that's up to our Father, but I'm just saying, they now know the truth. Verse uh, 36, I think. Yeah, verse 36. He brought them out after that he had showed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, in other words, the ten plagues, and in the Red Sea, and in the wilderness, forty years. We've been over that story, I don't know how many times now. Verse 37. This is that Moses which said unto the children of Israel, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you for your brethren. Like unto me, him ye shall hear. Now, this is what Moses said to the children of Israel. Let's read that again. This is what Moses said to the children of Israel. A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you and your brethren like unto me. In other words, a deliverer. Him ye shall hear. In other words, when he comes, listen to him. Did they listen to him, friend? No. Do people listen to him today? Well, a handful do. The remnant, the elect, and especially the very elect. Verse 38. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness, with the angel which spake to him in the Mount of Sinai, and with our fathers who received the lively oracles to give unto us. In other words, that's what Moses did. Moses gave to the people the oracles of God. But not only that, Christ gave to people the oracles of God. If you're wondering what oracles mean, look it up. It means the sayings of God, the utterances of God. Verse 39. To whom our fathers would not obey. The, the Israelites did not obey. But thrust him from them. In other words, they thrust God away. Do you see a pattern with what's been going on in America over the last, say, 70 to 100 years? God being cast out of our schools. No school prayer. Uh, creation being replaced by evolution. Uh people laughing at Christians, people calling for the death of Christians now, people pandering to the left wing. Um, look at all the bad things that have happened. Uh, gay and lesbian lifestyles being out in the open and celebrated. And on TV, on TV, shows filled with gay and lesbian characters highlighting them and highlighting all manner of things unholy. Shows like Lucifer, and Legion. I mean, these are popular shows on today's uh, television. A show called Lucifer and a show called Legion. And quite frankly, The Walking Dead, which pretty much amounts to the same thing, though it's about zombies. To whom our fathers would not obey, but thrust him from them. And in their hearts turned back again to Egypt, which is to say to bondage. Now, I want you to look at that prophetically and think about Christ in Moses' place. And I want you to read this from our perspective in our time. To whom our fathers would not obey and thrust him from them. In other words, they killed him, put him on the cross. And in their hearts turned back again to Egypt. In other words, to bondage, to the fleshly ways. To the, to the ways of Moloch, to the ways of false god worship, to traditions of men which make void the word of God, to the Torah and to the Talmud. Now, there's nothing wrong with the Torah if you understand that it is the schoolmaster and that you understand what parts of it were done away with the blood of Christ. Verse 40, Saying unto Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what has become of him. 
In other words, Moses was gone for 40 days, which is probation in biblical numerics. And they said unto Aaron, Make us gods. Lowercase g on the word gods there. What, what does this metaphorically mean to us? Aaron was the chief priest. Saying to the chief priest, Make us gods. In other words, give us different gods than the God that freed us from Egypt, that freed us from bondage, than Christ that freed us from bondage. To go before us, in other words, that we can follow after. As for this Moses, in other words, as for our deliverer, which brought us up out of the land of Egypt, which is to say uh, the same as Christ brought us out of the land of bondage uh, through his bloodshed, we know not what has become of him. Why? Because he's been gone 2,000 years almost. So people don't believe in him anymore. We don't know what's become of him. Many people don't even believe in Christ anyway. Verse 41. And they made a calf in those days and offered sacrifice unto the idol and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. In other words, they made the God with their own hands, and they rejoiced in the work of their own hands. Now, what is this symbolic of us uh, to us today? People today make their own doctrines. Okay? They make their own false doctrines, which is exactly what I was talking about earlier. As far as uh, my brethren, who are supposed to be elect with me in this running this race, and fellow students of the chapel even, you know, not that that really matters how you come to the truth, but uh, a, a lot of the Shepherd's Chapel community are beginning to become nutcases. And I have seen myself several occasions of this happen. People that I have known and talked to and uh, been close to have absolutely turned away from the teachings that, uh, that Pastor Murray put out. Not that Pastor Murray was right about everything. I mean, Pastor Murray, probably one of the greatest teachers that has ever lived on the planet Earth. But people now speak in terms of Murray and not in the terms of the Bible or the Word of God. I mean, I get a lot of people that say, Murray would say this or Murray would say that. Well, who the hell cares what Murray would say? I mean, believe me, I respected Pastor Murray. Pastor Murray was my main teacher for, uh, for all the years that he lived, and I continue to watch him to this very day. Okay? So, I'm not dissing on Pastor Murray. But as I mentioned in the last Bible study, people are becoming Murrayists. There is no book of Murray. Okay? There is the Word of God. And people are taking the mur words that Murray taught and twisting them into doctrines which they're making with their own hands, so to speak, metaphorically speaking. They're taking the words of Dennis Murray and Pastor Murray and changing them into a bunch of doctrines. Yes, brothers and sisters, the falling away is beginning. The great falling away. Verse 42, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. You know what the host of heaven are? That's the angels. And as it is written in the book of the prophets, O ye house of Israel, ye have offered to me slain beasts and sacrifices by the space of forty years in the wilderness? Question. Verse 43, Yea, Ye took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your God, Remphan. You know what the star of Remphan looks like? Have you ever seen the star of Remphan? A lot of people equate it to the star of Cayune. Cayune is actually the planet. Uh, it, it can be referred to as a star, but the star of Remphan is an ensign. It is a six-sided star that has six points and in the middle has a hexagonal shape. The same shape that we find on the planet Saturn which was named after Satan which has rings around it as though it were bound 
as Satan is bound. What is the standard of the tribe of Judah? What is the standard of the tribe of Judah and the children of Israel? I assure you it's not a star. Each of the tribes had a standard. And Ephraim, which many times refers to the children of Israel, or Manasseh, have two standards. And those two standards are mostly what refers to the children of Israel to this day, uh, except for the tribe of Judah, which sits upon the throne in the royalty of the royal families. And what is that sign? What was the sign of the tribe of Judah? It was a lion, or a young lion, lion's whelp. It was a lion or three lions. Now the reason I say three is because we see this on the coat, coat of arms. What was another symbol of David? The harp. But what was the actual sign of the tribe of Judah of which David was a member of? It was a lion. It was not a star. Okay? Now, I want you to think about this. There is a nation right now which calls itself Israel, which practices the Torah and does not accept the name of Jesus Christ. Okay? And they have a star for their symbol, a six-sided star. What is the number six in biblical numerics? The exceeding sinfulness of man. What do you suppose the number six might represent? I mean, of course it represents the flesh. Of course it represents the, uh, the sixth trump, the sixth seal, the sixth vial. And what happens when that, you see that happen? Well, Satan comes. So if you want to put a banner in a place on the earth where Satan is going to show up, what do you choose? Maybe a six-sided star. The star of Rimfan. Anyway, I'm going to leave that there, and you can mull it over and chew the cut on it. Uh, let's go back and reread that verse. Verse 43. Yea, ye took up the tabernacle of Molech. That is to say the practice of burning your children uh, to Baal, Baal, which is a false god. And the star of your God, lowercase g, Rimphan, which uh, figures which he made to worship them. In other words, little figurines, and uh, much as the uh, children of Israel did uh, with the golden calf, they handmade their own gods. And I will carry you away beyond Babylon. In other words, beyond confusion. But not only that, they got carried into Babylon which is to say, literally speaking, to the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar. Verse 44. Our fathers had the tabernacle of the witness in the wilderness, as he had appointed, speaking unto Moses, that he should make it according to the fashion that he had seen. In other words, God gave man a tabernacle. Now, first, it was that material tabernacle. Then it was a temple built by Solomon, which was the tabernacle. That temple was torn down, and then another was built, okay, after, after the Babylonian captivity, which also came to ruin by Rome. But what is our real tabernacle? What is our real dwelling place that God inhabits? It is the body of Christ. It is Christ. It is Christ, our Passover. It is Christ, our rest. Verse 45, which also our fathers that came after brought in with Jesus into the possession of the Gentiles. In other words, they handed it over to the Gentiles. Do you know what the children of Cain are? They're Gentiles. They're not Israelites. Whom God drave out before the face of your fathers unto the days of David. In other words, from the time that Moses... Uh, led the tribes out, and they did enter the uh, Holy Land, they began driving the people out that were Gentiles, which is to say Goy or Goyim. 
These were people that had inbreded with fallen angels. They were people that practiced filthy habits that were perverse unto God. They were people that were not learned of God. Even if they were Adamic, even if they were Abrahamic, mattered not. They were Gentiles. They sacrificed their children. They did horrible things. And God drove them out of the land. Until the book of Joshua when the Hivites snuck in and that's when your Kenites entered into the tribes of Israel. Cunning and wily. Verse 46. Who found favor before God and desired to find a tabernacle for the God of Jacob. In other words, David wanted to find a tabernacle. He wanted to build God a temple. Verse 47. But Solomon built him a house. In other words, David was not allowed to build God a temple. Uh, no doubt because of what David accomplished in his life, some of it bad, uh, especially concerning Uriah. When David was a younger man, he had it in his heart to, uh, to please God, but he let his flesh get the better of him, as did Solomon after him. Solomon also fell off to idol worship. Solomon even accepting 666 pieces of gold from the Queen of Sheba, a Gentile. Uh, just kind of a note in passing there. When you see 666 in the Bible, you you got to perk up and take note of it. But Solomon built him a house. Okay, so Solomon built him a temple. Verse 48. Howbeit the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands, saith the prophet. Now, you can go and look that one up for yourself. I, you know, I do most of the leg work when it comes to teaching people things, but people are finding it ever and ever more increasingly easy just to ask me to give them the straight answers to stuff. When you see something like this, in other words, when Christ or anyone in the Bible quoted somebody else, they did it for a reason. So go and look it up. And if you don't know how to look it up, learn how to. I'll give you a clue of how you can look up this statement. Go to the Strong's Blue Lexicon online or go to Eliyah.com and type in, uh, Howbeit the Most High dwelleth in temples not made with hands. Okay? And uh, you'll find out who the prophet was. As I said, I'm, I'm about through with the easy answers. It's time to quit sucking on the baby's milk teat and start eating some real meat. Okay? And I'm not saying that to come down on anybody, but um, we're getting towards the time now when things are going to change fairly rapidly. And when they do... You've got to be ready for it, and you, you can't depend on someone else, so study hard, study heavy, study deep. Verse 49, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. And what house will ye build me, saith the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? In other words, God didn't want a, hand, a, a, a temple built with man's hands. That's why he sent us a temple that was not built with hands. If you get the connotation to that, the altars in the old times, say in the time of Noah, in the time of Abraham, may have been built by men's hands, as in stacked rocks, but they were not rocks hewn with men's hands as the temples, or as this temple was. They were natural stones, or they were high places that God chose. Verse 50, hath not my hand made all these things? In other words, that, that's our Father speaking that. In other words, what do you think to make me? Has not my hand made the world that you, ver that you dwell upon? And the very bodies that you dwell in? And you're wanting to build me a temple? You see, the thing here is that anytime you put something in the hands of a man, it's going to be corrupted. And that's what God is pointing to here. That is what has happened with his word. And sadly, that is what I'm referring to with my fellow brother elect, 
and fellow people that I thought understood many things that are now beginning to uh, confound me with where they're coming up with their doctrines. Verse 51. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in hearts and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do ye. In other words, God pours out the Spirit to those that will receive it, and, and people resist it. Even today, I've made the, made the statement, you can't give salvation away, even though it's free. Christ paid that awesome price for it. And you can't give it away to people. They don't want it. They would rather believe that they're going to end up in the hole in the ground, and that they're going to become worm food, than to believe that they're going to live forever and imagine, uh, if you could call it imagining, I don't think they can imagine. And it's not really an imaginary thing anyway. It's a, it's a reality. But they would rather believe that they're going to be a, end up in a hole in the ground as worm food than to be reunited with loved ones and with their former pets and live in peace for all eternity with our Father, never knowing tears or sorrow or pain again. I mean, what kind of idiocy does it take to want that over God? Or over salvation? I mean, let's just play devil's advocate here. Let's say that there was no God, okay? And I've said this before. Let's just say that you're right, atheist. That there is no God. What do you have to lose by believing on God? I mean, if you're right and there is no God, upon your death, to whom are you going to gloat? Nobody, because you're going to be dead. You're going to be worm food like you think. However, if we Christians are right, then you're going to be standing before the God of your fathers, begging on your knees naked and sorrowful for your very soul's life. It just doesn't make sense to me. You know, what makes you feel superior to God or to God's children? That you think you have figured out something or that this book is not going to pull the wool over your eyes. This book's not trying to pull over wool over your eyes. This book is the Word of God trying to give you salvation so that you live for all eternity. I mean, my God, what does it take to get that through your thick skulls? Verse 52. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? Again, Matthew chapter 23 and John chapter 8. Matthew chapter 23, the very words of Christ almost. Which of the prophets have your fathers not persecuted? In other words, everyone that God ever sent forth has been prosecuted. Or persecuted, rather. Persecuted, dissed, uh, made fun of, hated, especially amongst their own. And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. In other words, you slew the prophets, your, your family, your, your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your progeny, the, the, the line of Cain, the serpent seed, and the children of Israel that followed them, the synagogue of Satan, as it were, persecuted the prophets and slew those that spoke of the coming of the just one, which is to say Mashiach, or Messiah, which is to say Christos, the anointed one, Christ, Jesus Christ. They slew those that spoke of the coming of Jesus Christ and afterwards, when Christ came, they murdered him, and they have been murdering and betraying their brethren, who spoke after the wise of Christ, taking his message forward after his death. Verse 53. Who have received the law by the disposition of angels, and have not kept it? Verse 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed their teeth on him. This does not mean that they actually bit him. 
It means they gnashed their teeth at him. They, they had pure hatred for him. The truth hurts, friend. The truth hurts. Verse 55. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, looking up steadfastly into heaven, and saw the God, uh, uh, or the glory of God, and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Not sitting on the right hand of God, standing on the right hand of God. Why would Jesus be standing on the right hand of God? I mean, Jesus could see just as well sitting on the right hand. Standing is action, friend. Letting Stephen know that Christ was standing, that he could see this. Verse 56, and said, Behold, I see the heavens opened, and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. He's, of course, speaking of Christ, who came into the flesh, being called a Son of Man, making himself a little lower than the angels, coming into the very filthy, dirty, nasty flesh that we dwell in not asking us to do something that he wouldn't do himself, and then giving up his life for us. Verse 57. And they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him in a, uh, with one accord. In other words, they cried out in a loud voice. Now, what are they crying out? Well, words of hatred, no doubt, to silence him. But this amounts to going, blah, 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 I can't hear you, I can't hear you, I can't hear you. This is the old hear, uh, uh, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, except that they are speaking evil. They are preaching evil, and they're practicing evil. They cried out with a loud voice, in other words, in their anger as they gnashed on him with their teeth, and stopped their ears. They don't want to hear it, friend. They love the darkness and despise the light and ran upon him with one accord, in other words, to kill him, as they had done with Christ before. Verse 58. And cast him out of the city, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet whose name was Saul. This is Saul of Tarshish, who will become Paul, the Apostle, and who will write most of the New Testament. Verse 59, And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, uh, this was Stephen calling upon God, not them. They're not calling upon God. You know, the Kenites are referred to many times in the Bible as thorns and briars. They're also referred to as being strong in the clefts of the rock. Well, they're stoning people to death. Just a little something in passing there for you. They're chips off the old block, the false rock. They stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. In other words, that's what his words were. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, saying, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. In other words, he died. This uh, sleep used a number of times throughout the New Testament to talk of death. But what did he do? He said, lay it not to their charge, Father. In other words, he was praying for them as they killed him. Again, this man, an example, a type for you. We're going to be delivered up, and we're not going to suffer the way this man did. Because our Father is going to speak through us. But you have to be as strong as this man was, and willing to meet death if it comes to it. If it is required of you. Not saying it will be. It's written that not one hair on your head shall be harmed. And it's written that you shall have ten days tribulation. Okay? Uh, at least for one of the churches. But uh, regardless, you've got to be willing to lay down your life 
and do the same sacrifice that he did. So, at any rate, I hope this Bible study has helped you. I hope you understand the faith that Stephen had. And I hope you understand that Paul would regret this for the rest of his life. Paul, who was called Saul here, would regret this and the many other things that he did for the rest of his life. And a lot of people, the tribes of the earth shall mourn at the return of Christ because they will realize that they have been duped into false religion. Religion made of man's hands. Religions that make void the word of God. The same thing as idols, except they're false doctrines, which are so prevalent in today's churches. And I could name a bunch of churches. I've even been... Uh, had someone say something to me about that recently, about me calling churches out by name. Let, let me explain one thing to some of you. I may sit here with blue curtains behind me and teach the Bible and have studied under Pastor Murray, but I assure you I am not Pastor Arnold Benjamin Murray. My name is Bruce McGill. And I don't subscribe to the same ways and means that Murray's taught, uh, Murray taught. I will call people out if I think they're a crooked SOB or uh, someone who's screwing people out of money. You know, I have mentioned uh, the Reverends Jesse Jackson and Al Sharpton and Creflo Dollar, along with Jimmy Swaggart and Oral Roberts and Ernest Ainsley and, uh, well, a, a, a host of others, Joel Osteen and the Pope and uh, the Pope before him and the Pope before him and I really don't care who likes it or who doesn't like it and I really don't care if people say Murray would sharply rebuke you for this uh, I very seriously doubt it we live in a different time than Murray grew up in we now live in a different time than Murray was accustomed to though his teachings are still on the television and I am bold and zealous to teach the Word of God and I am a little bit more forceful and zealous to charge head on with it. So I'm not afraid to mention, uh, usually I don't call denominations out by name, uh, though some of these preachers, you can pretty much guess what denomination they are if you go and look them up. But it, no denomination is fully bad, and no flock of any church is fully bad. But their teachers... The ones that teach from the pulpit are the ones who are going to answer to God first. And if they're getting rich off of their flock, and their flock being lower class or middle class or working class, then uh, what need do they have with a 30 or a $300 million mansion and five swimming pools and three tennis courts and two private golf courses, and their own jets. You know, what makes them so much better? Did the disciples do any of that? So, for those of you that want to come down or unscribe from me, uh, unsubscribe from me because I mentioned a person by name, adios amigos, have fun. I'm not a wuss and I'm not a wimp. Okay? And I'm not playing games here. So, you know, if you can't take the heat, then get the hell out of the kitchen. You know, this Bible study is for people that want the meat of God's Word. It's not for people that want to suck on a little sweet honey dripping sucker. Because this is a battle for good versus evil. For light versus darkness. For the very souls of mankind, and it's not a game. So, yes, I will call people out. Again, I'm not Arnold Murray. And I'm sorry if that offends some of you. And I'm sorry if it bothers you. You know, I, I would that you would be uh, like a lot of these people. I mean, I, you could go through the Bible, and if Moses spoke to Pharaoh, he was calling Pharaoh out. Um... If the three Hebrew children spoke to the king of Babylon and said, We are not careful to answer you in this manner, O king, they were calling the king out. Okay, so I'm not going to be worried about calling some idiot preachers out who are getting rich off a bunch of their sheeple flock 
who don't know the difference between God's Word and who haven't studied from the Greek and the Hebrew, who don't know anything about metaphoric speech, who are complete literalists, and who have listened to Pastor Murray, who said, let's not judge anyone. Okay, well, let me say one thing about that right now. I am not judging anyone. My voice does not judge anyone to hell. It does not decide what place their soul is going to spend uh, eternity, which is to say, dead in hell or alive in heaven. My voice does not carry that kind of weight. God alone is judge. However, if I speak a thing from the Word of God, because it is a truth, let's say, for instance, if I say that homosexuality and lesbianism and pedophilia are moral sins, somebody's going to get offended by that, and I don't care. I don't care if they get offended by it. You know why? Because it's not me that made that judgment. It is our God who created our souls. And they will see in due time in the course of their lives or at the coming of Christ that I was right about that. I would that they would turn and turn back to our Father and be as God's will would have them be. In other words, that they would repent that they would come to repentance and live. So, like I said, if I seem a little bit harsh, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry that you're offended. But, you know, grow a pair, okay? These Bible studies are for grown-ups. And that's why I'm not afraid occasionally to, to drop a, a swear word. You know, because I do get emotional. I do get upset about these things. My brothers' and my sisters' lives are at stake. Do you understand that? Their very souls are at stake, and I am not playing a game with this. I take this very seriously, and I will accept the judgment of God if he, if he says, Bruce, you are all wet, and you should have never have done that. Then I will accept that, because I know that our Father is just and right, okay? But don't sit in judgment of me or say that I sit in judgment of people when I call someone down for doing wrong. Okay? Christ himself gave us examples uh, of a rich man who had the choice between his riches or following Christ. What did he, did he choose? He chose his riches. And Christ would speak about this many times. So, if I speak it, it's because it's in the Bible. It's not because I'm making it up. I'm not pulling it out of my hind end. I'm pulling it out of the word of our Father. And I'm not judging anybody. It's not mine to judge. However, I will call them out or call them down for it. It won't do any good, I realize. And it will probably drive people away. Maybe it will. Either that or it will make a man up. At any rate, that's where I'm going to end things. And, uh... I do apologize if I have offended uh, some of you. Um, you know, I, I am not used to worrying about walking around on eggshells or having to worry about little delicate flowers that wilt over when the slightest little heated wind comes along. You know, we are God's election. We are God's champions. We're not, we are supposed to stand. When the Antichrist comes, if you, if you think I'm harsh, just wait, friend. At any rate, that being said, stay in our Father's Word every day if you can, certainly every week. Use the tools afforded to us to study our Father's Word. The King James Bible, the Strong's Exhaustive Concordance, the J.P. Green's Interlinear, the E.W. Bullinger Companion Bible, the Smith's Bible Dictionary, and books like Biblical Mathematics. Learn the manners of speech of the ancients so that you know what they were talking about when they spoke metaphorically. So that you can understand our Father. Grasp the key of David. God will give it to you if you ask. And make sure that's the most important thing. Pray to our Father, first and foremost, that He will grant you that knowledge and that wisdom and that understanding. And brothers and sisters, always pray for those that walk in darkness. You know, I may 
come down on Osteen, Swaggart, uh, Blackstone, Creflo Dollar, Sharpton, Jackson. I don't mean I don't pray for their souls. I don't mean I don't care about them totally. I simply don't care for what they teach and for what they push, which is to say liberal agenda, socialist or communist agenda, or false doctrines which make them rich and make men poor. And I think God would back me up on that. So, always remember to pray for those that walk in darkness because they are the ones that need it the most. Until we see you next time, may God bless you and thank you for listening. This has been Just Thoughts.